So for delineations, for the delineation of wetland boundaries, we're looking for these boundaries to be updated every five years. So wetlands are dynamic resources being a, an area between land and water. You can imagine that a change in the climate locally, um, changes in construction in an area might divert water and you can have different sizes and shapes of wetlands across time. So we're looking for uh, boundaries being delineated um, five years or less to be used for wetland permitting and 250 projects. So keep in mind there's no grandfathering for projects that have a valid Act 250 permit or wastewater permits. These permits go well beyond a five year period and um, if you haven't constructed the project, you do need to review for wetlands um, before you start to construct, if that's five years afterwards. The delineations should also include partially developed areas and disturbed areas, including lawns. Um, here's, here's an example of a site where the disturbed area wasn't delineated. And um, you see that the in the second shot here that the wetland had expanded over time and was completely within the area where a building was proposed. Out of season boundaries cannot be accepted for permitting. Uh, our rules specifically state that you must follow the Army Corps of Engineers manual. Um, our program staff do not validate delineations outside of the growing season. Um, so we're looking for maybe another week or so for some areas to be officially within the growing season. And you can do a preliminary boundary out of the season for project planning. That is a good idea if a project is moving along, but you'll need to review and verify that delineation. So please review boundaries during the growing season after your preliminary work um, and make changes to those, preferably before the ecologist goes out to the site. So that way, um, we're, we're able to give more concise guidance once we're, we've reviewed a site. Uh, we prefer to do our delineation reviews during pre-application consultations. It's a good way to do two things at the same time. And we also prefer to review delineations when they're fresh so that there is fresh um, flagging up. You can also add new flagging, but um, soon after the delineation makes that easier. There are many difficult wetland situations in the state of Vermont, um, and there's a special chapter in the Army Corps of Engineers manual. Um, it's called Chapter 5 of the North, Central, and Northeast Supplement. There's specifics for lands used for agriculture and silviculture because of their alterations to vegetation, they can become very difficult to evaluate. There's also problematic hydrophytic vegetation. Vegetation that normally grows in uplands can sometimes be found in wetlands. Problematic hydric soils. Wetlands that periodically lack indicators of wetland hydrology and wetland, non-wetland mosaics. Those are all subchapters within chapter five, so I encourage you to take a look at that and brush up on it. Um, we're already in the in the dry. Um, it's a particularly dry spring so far, so I especially encourage you to look at this section on um, when you're lacking indicators of wetland hydrology. Um, the dry season is considered the period of the year when the soil moisture is normally being depleted and water tables are falling to low levels in response to decreased precipitation and or increased evapotranspiration, usually during late spring and summer. 
um, if it's the dry season and no, there is no um, significant hydrological manipulation in the area and you have wetland plants and wetland soils, it should be considered a wetland. Um, now, sometimes with these difficult sites, there can be disagreements and delineations. Um, I frequently come out to do a, a second check on sites and you can it is very helpful that you um, fill out your army corps of engineers form for this type of evaluation and keep in mind that we'd like you to record whether you have abnormal climate conditions and if normal circumstances are or are not present on the army corps forms to help us with our evaluations Quickly, um, we evaluate wetlands based on their functions and values. Class one wetlands are exceptional or irreplaceable, and it is very difficult to get a permit for these wetland areas. They have a 100 foot buffer or larger, depending on the specific wetland. And that is in the appendix of the Vermont wetland rules, and all of these wetlands are mapped. Class two wetlands are um, wetlands with significant function or value, any of those 10 functions and values. They have a standard 50 foot buffer. They're protected by the wetland rules, so activities in them of their wetland buffer require a permit. Not all class two wetlands are mapped. Um, many of them are considered presumptive class two, which I will get into. Class three wetlands are neither class one or class two wetlands. They receive no buffer and they're not regulated by the state, but they are commonly regulated by the Army Corps of Engineers. So wetland classifications, we have this classification form that's up on our website. And for this presentation, I have many links here at the bottom, which we will be posting these slides and they will be clickable links. So don't worry about quickly typing them in. I know they're fairly long. Um, in 2018, we created a classification guidance document and form, which has, um, all the information you need gives you some guidance on details of the presumptions of significance, um, gives you good tips for what you should consider the study area, um, and gives you a, a really good way to document everything that we need so we're able to make jurisdictional calls for wetlands. And we may be able to even do that without a site visit, so it would um, behoove you to take a look at this form and um, use it when you're you're doing work uh, in Vermont. This form is especially important for when there is a dispute of uh, delineations. Uh, it has enough information that it can be reviewed in the office and then have a more thorough review in the field with all of that information. One important point is to, uh, you should be looking beyond the study area um, over desktop, line of sight, or getting permissions to go outside of your study area to see where the wetland goes, to see if the wetland is much larger than what it is on the site because it may meet a presumption of significance and the wetland may have more functions and values as well, which you need to document in your permit application. Once you receive your preliminary classification report by the ecologist, uh, you may fill out a formal determination petition if um, you don't agree with that determination and those form non-formal classifications by staff can be disputed at any time but not just 30 days after we send out the form 
Uh, giving incorrect classifications on site plans can lead to violations. Now, this is a good reminder. When you're creating preliminary um, site plans for your um, for your clients, they may look at these delineations years later and um, have the wrong impression on what is and isn't pr protected. So keep keep in mind when you're providing that information um, that you make it really clear that there still needs to be evaluation by the program. We received specific questions from our RSVP on the what I'll call the water adjacency presumption of significance. So section 4.6 of the Vermont wetland rules um, gives a list of wetland characteristics where those wetlands are presumed to be class two and protected under the what Vermont wetland rules unless otherwise determined by the secretary of the agency of natural resources. And so these two presumptions our wetlands contain woody vegetation and is adjacent to a stream, river, or open body of water, or the wetland contains dense, persistent, non-woody vegetation and is adjacent to a stream, river, or open body of water. Um, so the major question here is, is the wetland touching open water? The wetland does not need to extend along the stream for a predetermined distance. Any wetland within a water body with a water body connection along with the correct vegetation would meet this presumption. So here we have a, a stream and a wetland that is contributing cold water. This is a seepage wetland um, and that's really important for fish habitat to produce cold water streams. So this wetland is presumed class two. And this wetland, which is further along the stream, maybe has some, um, receives floodwaters from this stream. This is also presumed class two. Now, when a wetland is sparsely vegetated, or vegetated primarily by non-persistent herbaceous vegetation, the wetland does not meet this presumption. So here we have a wetland that is along the stream, but it's depicted as brown because it does not have a lot of vegetation in it, and so it is not providing a lot of erosion control or um, fish habitat, so it's, it's, it does not meet the presumption. All of the other ones do, even though um, this wetland is only connected at a small point. So contiguous wetlands versus presumptive wetlands. So wetlands that are mapped on the Vermont Significant Wetlands inventory map here depicted in teal are considered class two wetlands that continue um, along to that mapped wetland are also considered class two and protected. Now with our application forms, there's more information to fill out for presumptive class two wetlands. So it's a really good idea for your client for you to explore further than the site. So here we have a, a property where a consultant did delineations here and here and over here. This wetland delineation ends and it isn't mapped, but if you see very close by, there's mapped wetland. So this would be considered contiguous because we could see that the vegetation uh, for hydrophytic plants continued. So we would want to see this on a permit as contiguous class two. Same for this wetland, even though it's across the street from this VSWI, there's a culvert that goes across. And so uh, where water goes over, under, or through man-made structures, that wetland is still considered contiguous and protected. Another 
trick to review is if a wetland is in a disturbed area, it may be connected to additional undisturbed wetland in B class two. So you may have wetland in a lawn and it extends into a forested area that provides important habitat. Um, presumptive wetlands need a formal determination with the permit decision. So there's additional permit application sections needed. So here, hypothetically, there's a wetland that's entirely contained within this parcel. It's a forested wetland and is over half an acre in size. So it meets a presumption of significance. However, it clearly doesn't connect to any other wetland. So we need to um, we need to review that. We have a guidance from um, 2017, our contiguous wetland guidance. If you want more details on um, common situations, ski slopes is one example where within the slope it may be disturbed wetland, but the wetland may extend off into forested area and connect to streams. So really make sure you check out beyond um, your regular evaluation area to ensure that you're capturing all of the information that's necessary for wetland permits. So another trick for um, making sure the wetland is or isn't mapped is looking at our classification reports. So the district wetlands ecologist in Vermont, when we go out to a site and we evaluate a wetland, we send you a preliminary classification report if the wetland is not clearly mapped. And so in this image, we see there's a, a wetland area that's connected to a stream and so it was found to meet a presumption of significance. So if you have this in the file, it makes it easier for you to know whether to call it presumptive or contiguous. Just last week, um, we now have a blank Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory geodatabase that you can download from our website and use it for submitting. Um, within your applications. This has all of this, the attribute data. It's in the correct datum, so you can submit it and it can help us quickly um, process that portion of your application. If you don't have GIS, you can use the Vermont Atlas for creating a shape file. And down here we have a guidance document for how to do that. So you can provide us with a shape file with your application. Now, classification determinations with permit applications can slow the review if we don't receive a shape file or geo database. So I really strongly encourage you to create those so that we can more quickly process permits for your client. So when you're submitting your polygons, uh, there are a few attributes which we'd like information on, and that is so we can create really good data for the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory. The more we know about the wetlands, the better we can manage them. And we really thank you for providing us this information in a digestible format. Uh, Remember to use the wetland codes within the Cowardin classification system. Here's an image of that system and the water regimes. We'd like you to use this, this datum, NAD83. Um, we prefer that you use the same wetland ID code in your application as you use in your shape file so it's easier for us to find and connect and also prefer that you don't create arrows in the shape files themselves when you have a wetland that continues beyond because we have to correct those. We're not including those arrows in the official inventory. Do we have any questions so far on uh, presumptions or classifications or or delineations. Shannon, do you see any hands up? I do not at the moment. OK, well, I'll continue along.
So this next section, I'm going to go over all things wetland permitting, um, starting with our allowed uses, which some require approval. Uh, we have a non-reporting general permit option, registrations that just require that you submit a form, general permits, which are a simpler form but still has a 14 day public notice and then our individual permit which has the longest application form and a 30 day notice i'll also touch upon the water quality general permit which has three types of permits all wrapped into one we also have a lot um, better guidance for you with the allowed uses. So here's a list of some of the common allowed uses that we see being used. Silviculture is the maintained harvest and regrowth of forested areas. It's important to note this is not land clearing. If somebody is cutting down a forest to then later permit a shopping center, then that is not considered silviculture and that land clearing should have received a wetlands permit. I'll give more detail on these three types of allowed uses based off of RSVP request. I also want to make sure to have you notice that wetland and stream restoration is an allowed use. However, those activities need to be approved by the program. So before you plug ditches um, and create um, restoration projects, we do need to evaluate and send you a letter that approves that work before you can start doing it. Allowed use 6.12 is a very common allowed use that's used all the time. Uh, basically, our permits are construction permits and this allowed use after you've constructed allows you to continue to um, use that constructed um, structure or facility for its intended purpose. So the allowed use is for the maintenance, reconstruction, or routine repair of structures and facilities or additions to such structures or facilities which do not involve substantial expansion or modification in a wetland or buffer. We have a full guidance document um, linked below. Um, and this image here uh, speaks to the abandonment and the um, reconstruction portion of this allowed you. So here we have a house that unfortunately burns down and they have a couple of options for replacing it. They can um, put it in the same footprint, same size. It can be taller um, as long as it's within the same footprint. But if it's expanding substantially, which I'll get into in a little bit, it requires a permit. Um, so a structure or facility is considered abandoned if it is, its original features are not evident and or it cannot be easily distinguished from the adjacent area. So consider if this, this house was burnt down um, or fell apart over the years and has a bunch of ferns growing in it and we can't tell the difference between it or the adjacent land. Um, abandonment also includes the relinquishment of a structure or facility that was not timely reconstructed. So this house burns down and it's not replaced within five years, then it's considered abandoned and you need a permit to do that work. In addition, um, 6.12, the guidance document, talks about temporary work zones and non-substantial 
modification. So work associated with the routine repair, maintenance and reconstruction of existing structures and facilities may be conducted in a temporary work zone extending up to 10 feet beyond the edge of an existing above ground structure or 20 feet centered over an underground pipe without a wetland permit. So here in the image, we have some repair work being done to an underground utility and there is a 20 foot work zone where um, there can be some disturbance occurring in these areas. Um, now that's with the understanding that all of the temporary work zone shall be restored to the natural grade and revegetated upon project completion. So after this work is done, we don't have um, higher elevations in here. We also allow the vegetation to regenerate. In addition, um, we have non substantial expansion of structure. So, a non substantial expansion means a one time expansion of an existing structure resulting in additional impacts to class two wetland or buffer of 250 square feet or less. Or it could be a one time ditch expansion up to 20% of the original width and depth if the deck if the ditch in order to stabilize it with riprap um, is is um, upgraded to meet the stormwater standards. The use of swamp mats for temporary access is not included in the calculation of the 250 square feet. So long as there's no cutting of woody vegetation, minimal soil compaction and the mats are in place for less than one growing season. Now I want to to pause for those folks who don't work in Vermont an awful lot. Our regulations are completely separate from the Army Corps of Engineers, so anything that goes for our allowed uses, exemptions and permitting may be different for the Army Corps, so you'll need to check with them. So I have some specific guidance for non-substantial expansion and modification for roads. So here we have a cross section of a road. The right of way is wider than the actual travel surface. Um, so the existing footprint for the sake of um, maintenance and upkeep is this existing footprint area out to the ditches, not out into the cattails. It's important to note that travel ways are not included as a structure or, or facility that can be maintained. So a travel way is a non-constructed constructed feature. It's simply an area that has been tr traditionally traveled upon. Common travel ways include trails, woods roads, and tractor paths, where the surface of the travel way is the same as the native material and not previously filled, um, although it may be compacted with, with tire ruts. Um, they don't qualify as a road under the wetland rules, so if you have a tractor path um, on a property where someone wants to put in a driveway, um, they will still need to come in for a permit in order to upgrade that travel way into a driveway. Now, oftentimes, um, tractor paths cross the wetland at the narrowest point, and those areas are already disturbed. So, those are likely a good place to be putting that structure for avoidance and minimization standards, um, but it still needs review and a permit and a delineation needs to take place. So there are many ancient roads in Vermont and naturalized roads cannot be maintained um, 
because they've been abandoned. So naturalization involves the non-use of a road such that it changes or reconverts to forest, shrub swamp, wet meadow, or marsh, and is no longer usable as a means of transportation with a standard vehicle. Also important to note that the right-of-way is not the existing structure or facility. I just want to really emphasize that if you have a right-of-way where there's no travel surface, uh, you need to come in for a permit for that activity. It's, it's not a free zone for wetland impacts, and we commonly receive questions about that. Going along, um, here we have some examples of non-substantial and substantial modifications. So some activities that are um, okay within roads as non-substantial include repaving, grading, adding additional gravel on the top of the surface um, so that the footprint does not expand. Those are all fine activities within the road prism or dig shows. Some activities that are not in allowed use include ditch maintenance, where they're made much wider and deeper than they were originally constructed. If you keep within that original size and scope of those ditches, that's that's totally fine. And we also have a modification for if you're um, bringing your ditch up to code for stormwater standards. Construction of an access road or clearing outside of the road prism to reach a construction site for culvert replacement or riprap is something that would be substantial and would need a wetlands permit. Also, you see here um, someone's doing a trench and fill project of putting a pipeline through the actual swamp area, and that would require a permit. In this instance, there's a utility that's within the rogue shoulder, and the rogue shoulder is going to, in the end, have the exact same um, slope, is going to be vegetated in the same way, and therefore this is not a substantial modification and does not need a wetlands permit. Any questions on um, non-substantial expansion or modification at this point? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> and I'll continue on to the next allowed use, which is the catwalks allowed use. Fences, boardwalks, and viewing platforms are the most common activities um, that are under this allowed use on section 6.16. Some important points for these is they need to follow best management practices. Laura, before we move, before we move on, I missed that Glenn had a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Glenn. You can unmute. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I was just wondering um, if you could place swamp mats down, say we put them too wide um, for an access road and build on top of that a temporary access road and still be an allowed use. Yeah, if you're if you're able to get all of that material out afterwards and it's it, you need, the footprint is the swamp mat touching the, the ground of the wetland, then that is that is fine. Um, if you need to cut woody vegetation to place those swamp mats, then you would need a permit for that clearing. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And it's also important to note that swamp mats specifically are considered fill to the Army Corps of Engineers. So you may need to get a self verification or a permit from the Army Corps to do that activity. But um, for the state of Vermont, we understand that this is a good way to access areas 
um, with low impact on the wetlands. And so it's oftentimes an allowed use that doesn't need a permit. So long as you don't have any permanent impacts to it, um, you know, like leaving the swamp maps there for the whole year or um, clearing woody vegetation, cutting it down so you can place the swamp mats. We'd want a permit in that instance too. Okay, so for um, boardwalks and viewing platforms and fences, we have a best management um, document here that is linked. Um, some important points of that document is that boardwalks and platforms need to allow air, light, water, and wildlife to flow or travel through the structure. So you can imagine if you had a boardwalk really tight to the ground um, without space between the different boards, you would end up with no vegetation underneath. Um, so in that instance, you would need to get a wetlands permit. And if you applied for a wetlands permit, we would work on um, ensuring that whatever minimization measures would take place. So we would ask you, well, why can't you make the boardwalk to allow air, light, and water and wildlife to flow through? Uh, another best management practice is that the boardwalk must be less than five feet wide. Um, we prefer them to be narrower as well so in the instance of um, creating a boardwalk for ada compliance you may consider having a narrower um, track that's wide enough for a wheelchair to go through and having a um, turnaround point or a place where two may pass one another either outside of the wetland area if it's a short wetland crossing or um having uh, designated spots to have bump outs of that boardwalk the boardwalks to follow the the bmps may be mounted on posts or floats where we're looking for these structures to be able to place without um needing heavy equipment to access the site and we're looking for no concrete footings, earthen fill, or crib work. We've really had a boom in trail work, and we expect to see more of that uh, with the COVID CARES Act funds and the American Rescue Plan. Uh, so we have created a trail building guidance document. It's just two pages. And that's what you're seeing here on the screen is the back side, the um, cheat sheet of that, um, which has specific guidance on when trails don't need a permit and when they do need a permit because trails are, can be um, very sustainable and be a light footprint on the landscape but there are many different types of trails and you can imagine, um, you know, there are some trails out there that are paved, um, that have gravel and such. And um, so this document speaks to the nuances between those two extremes of trail types and how you can navigate whether the trail needs a permit or not. And this is guidance for um, nonprofit groups who may not be able to hire a consultant to do this work, um, but it is also helpful for you wetland consultants out there. So please take a look. Any questions on trails? Oh, there's a hand raised. Alice, go ahead. OK, you can hear me. I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, when you have do need and you have a permit for a trail, um, does that permit also need to be reviewed and um, renewed every five years? 
That's a great question, Alice. Our wetland permits are valid for a five year period. Uh, so the construction has to occur within that five year period. And if you've if you've done the trail work and it's established, you're all set. Um, and um, maintaining that trail is an allowed use to continue to use it. If you haven't constructed your trail within that five year permit period, you can get an extension for that permit. And we have that form on our website, our permit information website. Um, I believe it's a it's a it's a small fee to renew it for an additional five years. Permits can only be uh, extended out to 10 years. So if the work isn't completed with af after that extension is granted that additional five years, then the applicant would need to come in for a new permit. OK, what if you're. You just by happenstance, I happen to notice that I think the uh, wetland area that the path is near or goes through is having changes. Would that need to be reviewed? Yes, that's also a really great question. So on the extension form, there's a place for uh, the applicant to give information on how the wetland was evaluated. So like at the beginning of my presentation, wetland delineations are valid for five years. Once you receive that permit, that delineation is valid for the term of the permit, so that full five years of the permit. Yeah. But to get an extension, you'll need to have somebody verify that um, the wetland boundaries haven't changed. And if they have changed, you can still get an extension, but if the wetland has expanded um, into the footprint of where the trail was being proposed, you may need to also get a minor amendment to account for those additional wetland impacts. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I see Levi has posted in the chat for presumption 4.6C, how is densely vegetated defined? Um, so we would be looking at the um, Cowardin classification and, you know, if it's if it's over 30 percent vegetated, um, then it it's considered that cover type class. Jonathan, I see your hand is raised. Hi, Laura, thank you. Um, in terms of woody vegetation, and say you're building a boardwalk through a wetland or immediately adjacent to a wetland, if there's some very low woody vegetation, ostensibly you are impacting it. So I'd assume that the definition for impact of woody vegetation requiring a permit would extend even to very low woody vegetation and just anything that you're impacting or shading. Um, no, not necessarily. It's if you're you're cutting that woody vegetation. So say you have a really low shrub layer and you're able to have your boardwalk high enough that you're not crushing the vegetation and it's it's still um, underneath that boardwalk and that would that would still qualify under the allowed use. OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK. So the third slide on. Allowed uses is non native nuisance plant control. This is one of our allowed uses where you commonly need to get approval by the program, even though it's an allowed use and there's no permit. It's somewhat of a quasi permit. Um, system where you contact your district ecologist. So specifically hand pulling of invasive nuisance plants is an allowed use that does not need a plan. 
Um, so you can, if you if you find a few purple loose strife that you think you can handle by hand pulling, go to town. Go ahead and do that. Thank you for doing that. Um, that's a really great way to prevent a population from establishing and spreading. Um, this allowed use is specifically for non-native nuisance plants. Um, you'll notice that the lakes and ponds program has um, a program for nuisance plant control, which may also mean native plants um, that are simply causing a nuisance being around people's docks. So if it's an instance where it's a nuisance plant, but it's native, it would need to receive a permit to do that activity under the wetland rules. If you need to do non-native nuisance control um, where you are spreading herbicide or um, maybe doing some sort of a mechanical treatment, uh, you must have a plan for us to approve. And here is the 10 points that we're looking for within your plan. Um, so you can copy and save this slide for future use. Uh, we want to know where the activity is occurring, what the wetland community is, what your target plant is, and if you've tried other methods like hand pulling. If there's any um, natural heritage features in and around this plant, we'd want you to contact the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department's Natural Heritage Program so that they can give you recommendations on what can occur so that you're not harming those natural heritage features. We'd like the proposed control plan. We want to know what type of products you'll be using, who will be doing the application. And we really like to see future monitoring and follow up. Oftentimes a one time spray doesn't do it. And um, we'd really like to be approving holistic plans um, instead of approving a plan every year. So please try to include whatever type of follow up you plan to do. We'd like to know the square footage that you are going to be treating for um, documentation purposes and if there are any associated permits with the site. And you can just email that to your district ecologist um, for review and approval. If you're part of or you're working for an organization that does a lot of non-native nuisance plant control, you may alternatively choose to come up with a master plan for um, invasive plant control where you would submit in general how you would meet points one through ten um, that all of your non-native nuisance plant control would follow um, for us to review and approve and then yearly you would submit to us your locations and the estimated square footage of area treated for um, documentation purposes. So I see I have a question. Oh, a couple questions. Great. Um, Dory asks, can you review the fencing allowed use commercial project with a perimeter fence versus new pasture, for instance. So um, going back to the best management practices for boardwalks and such, we're looking for, um, let me see if I can go back to that slide. Oh, I went too far. Um, no concrete footings, earth fill or crib work. So we're we're looking for fencing that's simply posts driven into the ground um, for commercial projects or for pasture and such. So you know, putting in Jersey barriers would would be filling, um, whereas putting up a chain link fence would not be. Um, 
It's also important to keep in mind if you have a commercial project with a fencing, um, will you be maintaining around that fence and will you need to do any clearing of um, woody vegetation in order to place that fence? And then that activity may actually need a permit. OK, Alice Peel asks, I have a group that wants to fence in a pond for safety because of a daycare for kids. The pond is a class two presumptive wetland. It is also in flood zone AE. I also notice that there is water flow in or out at one end of the pond. Can they fence it? So under loud use, yes, you can you can fence around that pond um, using a I'd imagine a chain link fence would would cover um, that daycare if you were to put that up it would keep the kids out of the pond oh and thank you Shannon for providing some of that clarification that for fencing allowed use requires that no filling grading removing vegetation or, or alteration of hydrology as long as those requirements are met, you can you can go ahead and put up your fence. OK, and another question comes in from Adam. For trails, how is the 250 square foot applied? Is it intended to be per wetland buffer crossing? That's a that's a really great question, Adam. Um, now trails. Um, you can have multiple spurs on your trails. You can have a whole trail system. Um, and in in general, I'd say, you know, yes, it's it's intended per wetland, but you should also talk with your district ecologist on that piece. Shannon, would you have anything more to add there? Um, yeah, with this is something that we kind of talked about with that 250 square feet. I guess I would mention that that is for existing trails. So if you needed to upgrade a crossing, let's say, for an existing trail to get across, um, you know, something that is looking muddy, you could impact that up to 250 square feet. If you're talking about adding on a whole new segment of of trail system, we would probably look at that more as not an allowed use, um, but a substantial modification. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, so now we're heading into the permitting realm from allowed uses. Um, one last point on the allowed uses is many of them do not require program approval. Um, I know many of you ask us, double check with us for verification, and I want to emphasize that if you're comfortable reading the guidance documents and the rules, uh, you can you can make that call for your client. Um, there are a number of allowed uses that do have um, best management practices that we're happy to give you more clarity on, as well as some that require actual approval. And that's all right in the wetland rules for you to find. So we have three different permit types um, currently that you could apply for. We have the 390-25, which is a, a general permit for impacts uh, less than 3,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet if it's a linear project. More impacts are allowed for those managed areas versus natural areas of wetlands, and you cannot get a general permit for impacting class one wetlands, um, wetlands with rare threatened or endangered species and other sensitive wetland types. We also have a second general permit, the 39026, uh, which is for certain water quality projects. So that includes um, agricultural trails and walkways, ag constructed 
wetlands, ag heavy use areas, or ag stream crossings. All of those are non-reporting, so you don't need to submit a registration or anything for those ag practices, those agricultural practices. There is a registration covered under this general permit, the water quality general permit for stormwater retrofit projects. And that's for either changes to existing stormwater features for a retrofit site or new structures on a retrofit site. And next month I'll be giving a presentation specifically for stormwater practitioners. You're all invited to sign up for that as well, and I'll be giving more details there on how to get coverage under that general permit. Stream crossing repair and replacements is another um, activity that's covered under the 390 26, excuse me, and also failing wastewater systems um, for impacts in wetland buffer is also covered. Um, we have also an individual permit application and there's two versions of that application form. One is for multiple wetland impacts and one is for a single wetland impact um, because there's a lot of, of formatting that needs to take place so you can add multiples. So we have a an Excel spreadsheet table for you to fill out information for each and every wetland that's impacted from a project. One uh, side effect of COVID was um, we were able to figure out how to get applications and fees uh, submitted online. Um, so now there is a generic application submittal form for the Watershed Management Division, link below, where you can attach your PDF application form and also submit the application fee um, through a &R online, and it makes it a lot simpler for us to process, especially when we're not in the office receiving the mail or the checks. So uh, for the details of your application, um, it's really important to emphasize that applicants have the burden of proof that they've followed the mitigation sequence. They have to be able to say that this work is absolutely necessary within the wetland in order to meet the basic project purpose. Um, we need to be able to say there's no other option and why there's no other option. And that needs to start with having the valid project purpose. So the project purpose can't be so specific as to prevent any type of avoidance and minimization, such as it has to occur right here in the wetland, this many square feet. That's much too much detail. Um, a more suitable valid project purpose would be um, to create uh, residents that would allow us to look at the size of the residents, where it can be placed upon the parcel, etc. As of last week, we now have a new checklist to help you work with your clients through the avoidance and minimization. In general, um, they should be considering all of these different practices for avoiding and minimizing impacts to the resource. And if they're not using that avoidance and minimization technique, they should be explaining why they're not doing that. So the application really needs to tell the story on why you can't do something. Um, we get a lot of applications just say, well, there's no other option. And what's more helpful is, you know, having the application say stuff like, 
Uh, we can't do a two story building because of town zoning. The other option was too expensive. Um, the alternative no longer meets the project purpose, things like that um, to give more of a narrative. We want to know why the wetland must be impact, what you did to avoid the wetland, and the application really needs to expel it, to speak for itself. We do a lot of pre application uh, discussions, which are really helpful for the permit reviewer and for you to get a better sense of how to design the project. But in the end, we need all of that narrative in the application. So somebody who is reviewing the application as an outsider can understand it and um, can hopefully agree with you and not try to appeal the permit. So um, here's some more application tips. Um, first tip is we have a tips page here in the link. So please take a look at that to refresh yourselves. So the application forms, it seems obvious all sections need to be filled out. However, that's not always the case. So we're saying it here. Um, we need you to answer the questions for the functions and values for the whole wetland complex. This is something that gets confused commonly. Um, we'd like you to say, you know, your activity may be occurring on a portion of the wetland that's not providing that function, and that's okay. That um, point two section of the um, functions and values section gives you a place to explain um, why it's it's not um, why the activity isn't um, impacting that function or value and point one also allows you to describe the subject wetland areas contribution to the function and value so you might have a wetland say Cornwall swamp thousands of acres in size but you're impacting an area that has historically been hayfield. You'll want to explain that that wetland has significant, even exemplary functions and values, um, has rare, threatened, and endangered species. But in your narrative, you'll be able to say this portion of the wetland proposed for impact does not have the rare, threatened, or endangered species. Um, habitat or population in that area. When you're working through the application form, you should also ask yourself, could a teenager understand? Um, you know, would could they look at the application and say back to you what the project is, where it's located, what the wetland does, and why the project must go there? If that's not the case, that means that um, we may be contacting you for more technical information and it may. Um, and, and you may have some opposition from neighbors. We have multiple attachments associated. Please include Army Corps data sheets for all representative wetland types. Um, functions and value sheets for all wetlands that can be based on the complex. Um, we need site plans showing all of the wetlands with their classifications and include the buffer zones. The site plans should show a realistic limits of disturbance. Like I said before, we have an allowed use for 10 feet around a structure, so you should be showing that 10 foot around the structure. For multi wetland tables, uh, for those applications, each functions and values identified for wetland must be explained for the specific wetland on table five of the impact statement. Um, and also, like mentioned before, include a shape file for your presumptive wetland additions. Any other questions for the application portion? Um, Alice Peel has her hand raised. Go ahead, Alice. Sorry, I have many questions today. Um, when you have a consultant, 
that has done a wetland study for you. And they produce a new mapping of wetland area. Um, they would then supply that to A and R for inclusion in the um, mapping that you can access on Vermont uh, Resources Atlas, et cetera. Does that submission require any approval from the town, be like the select board or anything like that? It does not require approval by the town. Uh, so there's a, a few different ways wetland mapping gets adopted. And the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory is a regulatory tool. So whenever the, um, whenever we get a permit application in um, for a wetland that's not included on the maps, those are our presumptive wetlands. Uh, we asked for shape file, and as part of the permit um, draft review, we're also posting the proposed map edition, which receives a 30 day public comment period. Um, and it gets sent to the town. So the town has the ability to um, provide comment. Um, I feel like it's been a few years since we've received any comments on our map editions. So they do have the ability to provide comment, but we don't explicitly require town approval. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Which is a great segue to um, oh, actually, I have a couple more slides. <laughs> so once you receive your permit or your client receives their permit, they have a couple of obligations to the wetlands program. And this is some service that you can um, offer to your clients um, to help them with town recording and for um, reporting on starting work. So we ask for those two um, records as well as a completion certification certifying that the work was completed in compliance with the permit. And thankfully, we can now submit these through ANR online and you can submit on behalf of your client. I suggest the fastest way to get to the forms is go to form finder and type in wetlands and you'll see all three of those those forms lined up. Um, we really need this information so that if somebody calls with a complaint, we know that it's for a permitted project. And it also helps us with tallying how we're achieving our goal of no net loss of wetland function and value. Um, surprisingly, there are some people who get permits and they never actually construct. Um, and so we, we really need to have information on whether the work started or has been completed in order to get a better sense of what's happening throughout the state of Vermont. So thank you for helping your clients submit that information.